hopefully the companies will realize that the best way to compete against the Spotify's and all of those is not try to do what they do, but to try to be great at what we've all always done uh, pretty well. For over 35 years, Fred Jacobs has provided research, consulting, and strategic guidance to those of us in radio. So I thought he was the perfect person to get on how to radio. I just wanted to talk to him about where we're going in the future. He does all the research with all the DJs. He does research with our listeners across the country, how they're listening to radio. He knows all this stuff and then gives it all to us. So I want to get it from the source itself. I thought, let's chat about radio and how we're going to survive the coronavirus, digital media, on-demand audio. We just kind of chatted about radio for 20 to 30 minutes. If you want to sit down and geek out with us, Keep on watching. It's How to Radio with Mr. Fred Jacobs. You know, everything's changed a little bit since uh, we got together in Chicago <laughs> yeah. last summer. I mean, doesn't it feel like uh, 10 years ago to you? I mean, oh, totally. And and so it's not that the data doesn't hold up really well, but I think so much has changed. I mean, Don Anthony and I have talked about doing a follow up study and, and he he had this delusion that there would actually be boot camp. Uh, this fall, I kept going, Don, we're not doing this, man. This is not going to happen, but he's doing the virtual thing. So, so we'll see, but I, I don't know whether we're going to be able to do a follow-up study this year. It would certainly be an anomaly, right? Just given how everybody is, is so completely impacted by, uh, the pandemic and, and all the associated effects that, uh, that it that, that it's had, but you know the the the, the data sort of speaks for itself. I think it was Don's idea, by the way. I'd love to take all the credit in the world. I I do a regular tech survey every year with radio station listeners, and we're still doing that uh, in both commercial public and Christian music radio. But it was Don's idea to actually do a study of disc jockeys. Um, and so we've done that the past couple of years and it really turned out to be revealing, I, I, I guess. And I never had thought of this until Don brought it up, of course, that no one has ever, I mean, we, we survey everybody in radio, right? We survey listeners and we survey advertisers and everything else, but we've actually never, uh, surveyed the people who are on the radio. And yeah. so that's what this study did. And I, I, I think. Uh, a, a bit of an eye opener. Uh, certainly, the first one and the second one indicated that things haven't changed all that much. So you did end up doing a, a tech survey this year. We we lucked out. Uh, we always fielded in Jan Feb, so we did again, and we got it uh, under the wire, I guess. Um, <laughs> and uh, before all hell broke loose, so yeah, it was a good, it was a good survey too. I mean, like. 46,000 respondents, 500 and something stations. Yeah, it's really gotten big. Uh, we do it across 14 different formats, and it's really the only study of its kind that helps guide um, stations pretty much regardless of whatever their format is. So, yeah. Did you see any huge differences between last year and this year as far as you know how listeners are listening? We're on this really interesting trajectory where – the way that people listen to their favorite radio stations. And keep in mind, our study is among essentially P1s. So, I mean, these are people in radio station databases. So these are not people who have given up on radio or barely listen. These tend to be people who are pretty regular radio listeners. So I, I believe in the 80-20 rule, which you probably heard me quote before, where 20% of a population uh, contributes 80% of the results. I mean, it's true in just about every walk of life, whether it's sales or ratings or, or anything else. And it is absolutely true in radio. So um, our sample, uh, most of the 46,000 are part of what we call the core 20, the people who are very engaged in radio. So when you can kind of get a beat on what they're up to and what they're thinking and, and how it's all evolving for them, I think it's really helpful for programmers. So, you know, the, the the big curve that's been going on is that people are still listening to radio and they're still enjoying it. However, the devices that they use to listen to radio on are changing rather dramatically. 
Um, there is less listening on regular radios and a lot more listening now on phones and tablets and laptops and smart speakers and all those kinds of things. And every year we see the traditional listenership going down and we see the digital listenership going up. And that's one of the reasons why we continue to reinforce, although some would say browbeat, uh, the industry that it's so critically important that your content be distributed wherever your audience prefers to be. Uh, the percentage of radios that people have in their homes uh, continues to also drop every year. So fewer and fewer people actually have working radios that they use in their home. So all the more important reasons why it's critically important to have a great app or to be very accessible uh, on Amazon or Google uh, smart speaker devices. And I think one of the real uh, impacts of the pandemic has been with so many people being home and not being in their cars and not commuting, all of a sudden, this has sort of separated the radio stations that were kind of ready for this versus those who were sort of mailing it in when it came to digital distribution. And now all of a sudden, it's like, whoa, uh, we, we've got all these listeners who don't have a radio or maybe they have one in the bedroom or the garage or whatever, but that doesn't do you a whole lot of good when you're in the family room or the living room or the kitchen. Yeah. So yeah, the, the, the COVID thing, like so many other things has, I think been a flashpoint for a lot of radio stations, but yeah, that, that ongoing move to digital. I mean, one of these years, Nick, we're, we're going to see the two lines cross and people are going to be using digital devices to listen to radio more than they do uh, AM, FM radios. Uh, I hope I'm still doing these surveys when the lines <laughs> cross. Do you consider yourself like a like a stats nerd? Yeah, kind of. I mean, what's interesting about it is, is that I don't love numbers and never really did. Um, so I'm not that guy, you okay. know, staring at spreadsheets all the time. In fact... You know, I, my background is in audience research, but but the research that I really love doing the most are focus groups and one on ones where I can actually talk to people and hear the emotions that that people have. I mean, you know, we're we're not in the windshield wiper blade business. We're in the we're in the radio business. It's a lot of fun and it's engaging and and it it's emotional and it drags people in. And when you're just staring at numbers all day it doesn't really do justice to um, the impact that radio has on people. So, yeah, I mean, I geek out on the ratings just like <laughs> everybody does. And, and I love research from the standpoint of it helping to guide programming. I mean, uh, one of my mentors referred to audience research as radar. And I think that's really a good way to look at it. I mean, you know, you, you can be a great captain, a great pilot, but without radar, it's really difficult to uh, to get around. But when you can actually see the landscape, you can understand what people are thinking. So I try not to get too heavy into the numbers. And I, I try to look for the numbers to tell a story. Um, you know, who wants to sit through an hour's worth of charts and graphs anyway, right? I mean, yeah. it, unless you can create a narrative and a storyline to the numbers and connect a few dots along the way, it, it's pretty dry. I've tried to do that with with the numbers that our company generates, and it's served me pretty well. Do you think that once everything goes digital, we'll obviously have a better track on exactly how people are using radio? If, if all radio goes you know, to smart speakers and we can track every listening moment, do you think that's going to be better for you? Yeah, and I think it'll be more accurate. I mean, unfortunately... Um, you know, the, the Nielsen system, and I'm not one of these guys who bashes Nielsen. I mean, I, you know, unlike program directors who go up and down on Nielsen, depending on what their current weekly <laughs> or, <laughs> or monthly tends to be. I mean, I, I think the Nielsen system, especially PPM, is essentially a good system. I mean, it, it measures real time listening. True. If somebody walks into a 7-Eleven and you know, there's a rock station on and they're in there for five minutes. They are going to get counted uh, as a rock listener that week. But I mean, but that's real, right? They were in proximity of that radio station and they kind of 
maybe in, in some way sort of hurt it. So I think PPM by and large does a pretty good measurement job of terrestrial radio. Where it falls short is measuring all the other ways that people listen. And the really frustrating part of the last decade or so has been radio isn't really getting the full credit that it should for all the different ways that people are listening. I mean, there's too many numbers spread across too many platforms, and there's not one way to sort of glom it all together and come up with a single number that, that, that really shows us who's out there, what's going on with them. So yeah, I think when the day comes, when it really is all tracked and when it is all digital, it'll be amazing. And we'll be able to keep up with the Spotify's and, <laughs> and everybody else out there because they've got this data. I mean, they, they know all the stuff that we're still sort of throwing darts at. So yeah, it's, it's, we're, we're really kind of working with a couple of hands behind our back. Other than ratings, what do you think radio can do to beat like a Spotify or, you know, I don't even know if I, Pandora exists anymore. I don't know why I'd say it, but like Spotify or online music listening. What is it that radio needs to do uh, to get with the times? Well, see, I'm pretty old school, as you can see. <laughs> um, but I, I actually think that the, that the things that got radio to the dance originally are what will be radio's salvation if we, in fact, um, stay true to what got us here to begin with, and that's personality. I mean, that is one of the things that certainly separates us from the Spotify's. I mean, we, we have personality. We are live and in the moment. I mean, there's an advantage to not being on demand. I mean, on demand is really cool, especially when it comes to watching television, right? I mean, <laughs> we, we don't have to wait around. Oh, it's almost nine o'clock. We have to stop doing what we're doing. No, I mean, we, we love the convenience of being able to access content at any point in time, but radio's real time in the moment presence is something that it has that all the other media really don't. So personality, real time, and then that local context are still important. So if you think about it, I mean, that's what radio was really doing well in the 60s and the 70s and in those decades, just intuitively. I mean, the programmers in those days just knew that that was their destiny. They, they had to be really good at capturing the moment and being really entertaining above and beyond the music and being in the marketplace and holding up a mirror to the audience and the community. And, and I think broadcast radio has gotten away from all of those things, unfortunately. But I think that's the journey back, you know, that, that hopefully the companies will realize that the best way to compete against the Spotify's and all of those is not try to do what they do, but to try to be great at what we've all always done uh, pretty well. Um, but you know that that's not a cheap way out. You, yeah. know, you can't voice track your way out of uh, out of this situation. Um, to be live and in the moment is expensive, and right now that goes against the grain of way of where commercial radio is in the states, unfortunately. Do you think that that's the main reason that's keeping programmers from just putting talent, like instead of focusing on seven second breaks, instead of just letting our talent go out, do you think it's mostly cost? I think cost is clearly a big factor, but unfortunately, you know, here I said nice things about PPM <laughs> a few minutes ago. So I'm going to probably contradict myself a little bit, but you know, it's, it's been around, I think about 12 years now, something like that. And um, when Arbitron, because that's who actually came up with the technology before they sold to Nielsen, uh, when Arbitron came out with it and really started staring at the numbers that it was generating, I think a mistake that in retrospect they made was to conclude that you should be pretty safe and you shouldn't take big risks with music or personalities or talk or whatever, because if you didn't do it right, if you played a bad record or you gabbed on about something without it really having a purpose, there would be meter migration was what they actually <laughs> called it at, at, at the beginning. And so unfortunately, I think a lot of companies and a lot of programmers really took that super seriously and just said, you know what, let's just 
quiet it down and shorten the breaks and let's be really safe and um, let, let's see what happens. And it tended to work for a lot of stations. And the beauty of it was it was pretty cheap, right? And, and so it worked well. However, when you actually look at some of the most successful radio stations in PPM markets, they tend to be rule breakers. I mean, up the road from you in Seattle, I mean, KISW is perhaps one of the least safe radio stations in the country, right? They've got personalities in, in all day parts and, you know, they're playing hard rock music and they do all kinds of ridiculous promotions and stuff that are really entertaining and, and compelling and it works for them. Now, not every radio station in town can do that. It would be kind of chaotic if they all tried to do that. <laughs> but I, I, I think PPM has unfortunately had a quieting effect on the business at precisely a time when we should have been rowing in the other direction. So it's, it's unfortunate that, that the planet sort of lined up that way, that right at the moment when we started getting some serious competition from all these digital sources, that was also the moment that everybody tightened up and, and decided, let's, let's play it safe. So here we are now, and it's, it's a bit of a conundrum for the industry to try and figure out where to go from here. Do you think that radio will always survive or do you think that we have something to worry about yes <laughs> I, I i think there will always be radio but if we're not careful and we don't get the message about what's happening right now and i don't just mean the pandemic i think the pandemic is is clearly accelerating a lot of what was going on i mean if you think about life pre-pandemic and now life as we are in the middle of this, a lot of the trends that were sort of bubbling under pre-pandemic now have been sort of supercharged, like um, Peloton, great example, right? People were working out at home, um, not en masse. Most people were still going into LA Fitness and Planet Fitness and, and all those gyms. But um, some of the early adopters were, were buying systems like Peloton and working out at home. Well, all of a sudden now that trend has totally been turbocharged and has become not just something that a few people do, but that a lot of people do. Same even with this technology we're on right now. Video chat has existed for a long, long time. But thanks to the pandemic and us being stuck at home, um, you know, I'm on probably four or five Zoom calls a day. Before the pandemic, I'd never even heard of Zoom. Isn't it crazy? And it just shows you that that brands that were not a big deal can be huge deals overnight. And, and you know, when you think about it, you know, Skype, which we're on now, owned by Microsoft and Hangouts owned by Google. I mean, you know, these are like ridiculously big companies. And here comes little Zoom. <laughs> and just, just amazing. But those are the techie times in which we live. I mean, a, a brand can come out of nowhere and and capture the zeitgeist of the moment. And Zoom has really done um, a, a, a really great job of, of, of doing that. So I, I think, you know, back to your question, broadcasters have to understand that the landscape is changing. I mean, that's why we do the tech surveys and related research. I mean, most radio stations are still doing audience research, but it's all on the meat and potatoes issues. You know, do you like that Jason Aldean song? Or are you familiar with our morning show? Or would you rather win $100 or $500? <laughs> I mean, those, those are still the meathead questions we're continuing to ask listeners. And, and I don't want to degrade the process because it's important to know the answers to all of that. But, but to see the larger ecoscape of how people's media habits are changing uh, is critically important. You know, I'm from Detroit. And so we've gotten really involved with cars, which has really been kind of a fun thing, but also scary. And, you know, when you talk about radio's continued uh, prominence or dominance, no, how, however you look at it. I mean, the car is critical, right? I mean, the lion's share of radio listening continues to take place while people are on four wheels. And yet dashboards now are, are essentially computers where people pair their phones and can basically access anything that is on their phones in their cars. 
And then you pile on top of that the fact that we're in our cars less than we've ever been ever thanks to the pandemic and this whole work from home thing now. I mean, that's just not a passing fad. I mean, a lot of people are going to end up working from home long after there's a vaccine, right? I mean, most of the tech companies are are leading the way. I think Google just announced that um, they're not going to even start thinking about bringing people back until mid uh, 2021, Twitter has basically said, stay home as long as you want. And, yeah. and, and Facebook and all the others are going through that same thing. So there's going to be fewer people in cars. Yeah, I think uh, that's one of the things that I, I, I immediately noticed is when everyone went home to work, I was like, well, this is the push every, every company needed to show that we could actually work from home. And I think that there, I don't think there's any going back. Even in radio, there's people that are working from home now. They're like, why are we have, especially with the new law that just passed, like, why do we even have full studios? We'll set you up with something at home and everybody can work from home now. It's just, I think this 2020 forced us to evolve. You know, the, I think the reality is, is that not everybody is great at working at home. Yeah. Uh, some people miss the collegial environment. I mean, radio in particular. I mean, one of the sacrifices I made when I left working for a radio company and for radio stations and went out on my own 37 years ago, I mean, the big sacrifice was not being in a radio station all the time because it is fun. I yeah. mean, it it's a great environment and, and very electric. I mean, I to this day, I, I walk into an air station studio and the molecules change. I mean, it's, it, it, it's, it's a rush. I mean, it, it really is. Even if you do this every day in an air studio, I mean, there is something special and even sacred about that room. And when you're not in a radio station, you don't feel that. And so I feel bad. I actually got into my first radio station a couple of weeks ago. It's the first time uh, I've actually walked in a radio station since early March and it creeped me out. I mean, <laughs> you know, here here's a building that normally has 130 people running around, and it was it was maybe there were eight or ten people in the building, and it was disturbing. So I I, I think what's going to happen maybe Nick is that there will be hybrid kind of things uh, after COVID subsides. I mean, there will be some people who will permanently be working from home, and there will be other people maybe even like the engineers uh, who will need to be in the building. And then there's going to be a whole lot of people where it'll be kind of a mixed bag. You know, yeah. maybe they'll come in a couple of days a week or, or, or something like that. But yeah, it's never going to be the same. Switching gears a little bit and just, and I'll, I'll let you go after this, but I, I read it in your blog, you know, who's teaching the future of radio. So how do you feel about the next generation of radio and who do you think is teaching the next gen and what can we do to make sure that there is a next gen? That's my existential worry. I mean, look, there's a lot of things to worry about out there, right? From the virus to what's going to be in cars and all that kind of thing. But yeah, the next generation of people who like you, you know, who are young and, and want to be in the radio business. I mean, I'm not sure where those people are coming from. I mean, one of the things that we learned in those AQ personality studies is that most of the people who are on the air right now got their start uh, working part-time weekends, overnights, and nights. And in most radio stations, that farm system doesn't exist anymore. Those, those shifts, those time slots are all voice tracked uh, at this point, or even worse, there's somebody segueing uh, uh, records mechanically and, and there's just no people there just firing off pieces of production in between the songs and while that may be economically efficient and uh, cost effective and all that stuff I mean it, it really doesn't take into account where that next generation of great young excited um, smart radio people are going to come from so I think it is going to be mentoring and i think it's going to be i mean look i think what you're doing right here um there needs to be more of that i mean this this is bootstraps mentoring in a different way dan valley's national radio talent uh, uh systems um that set up camp in uh, all these markets around the country uh catering to high school and college students that's a great thing too 
uh, the conclave when it's on its game, but it's all very piecemeal. And, and unfortunately, I think the industry as a whole really doesn't have a youth plan. And that's something that we're really going to need to think about. I mean, the good news is, is the Generation Z is a huge group. I mean, bigger than even us baby boomers were. But if they never grew up listening to radio, why are they going to want to be in this field? And, and that's something that I think a lot of people who are on the battle lines right now either don't have the time or the bandwidth to be able to deal with. So, you know, I, I think about an initiative just like yours and you know what, it, it, it may be fledgling at the moment, but it's important. And, and because training is virtually non-existent at this point, I, I'm afraid that when new people start in radio, I mean, we're kind of throwing them into the deep end of the pool. And there was always some of that. I mean, even back in the old days. But honestly, I was trained exceptionally well. I mean, and, and so were most people of my generation. I mean, between, you know, what I learned in college um, and then in my first couple of early gigs. I mean, there were always people around who put their arm around my shoulder. And, and again, not everything they told me was correct <laughs> or or you know may, may be especially helpful uh but but it was a great by and large it was really a great learning system and it was all mentoring and passing it forward and 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 i think we need to do that to the next generations here so again i mean kudos to you for doing this i mean, I, I i i i think more and more of these kinds of initiatives have to happen. Yeah, well, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. Um, what is it that you would like to teach the next generation or anybody watching this? Is there any last bit of knowledge that Fred Jacobs uh, can drop on all the fans? Because I know I'm going to share this on a couple radio Facebook pages and they all love you. So uh, what do you want to say well, to your you. adoring fans, Fred? Well, thank you. No, that's kind of you to say. I mean, I, look, I, I think the main thing in, and, you know, when I uh, got out of school and, and got into the workplace, I would get invited back uh, to high schools and colleges to teach young people about the real world and, you know, what radio is really like. And, you know, there, there was a shift. And I, I don't know that I can pinpoint exactly when it happened. I mean, maybe 15, 18, 20 years ago, turn of the century, something like that. But I started walking into these classrooms and instead of pontificating, about what the real world of radio is really like, I started asking them questions um, because I think especially digital natives have a completely different view of the world than certainly boomers and Xers uh, do. Uh, you millennials are sort of kind of caught in between, of course. But um, I, I, I think I, I think radio people need to do need to be better listeners and. And instead of bringing young people into radio and just having them hang up banners at events and do the street team thing, I think there's a lot of knowledge there and there's a lot of skills they have that maybe we don't have. And so I think a little bit more cross-pollination and collaboration between the generations would be a really healthy thing. Now, Fred, where can we uh, subscribe to your blog if we haven't done so already? You can uh, go actually just to the blog and you can sign up for it there. There's all these annoying pop-ups that will happen. It's uh, <laughs> jacobsmedia.com slash blog. Okay. And uh, there's new content every day. The blog is uh, almost 16 years old. Wow. And I write a new post every Monday through Friday. Yeah, I was going to say, are you the one still writing it? Like, I get them every morning, yeah. and I'm like, man, this guy's up early. I know. It, it's like an obsession. Um, I get a little help. I've got some outside contributors who will do a guest post now and again. I will do best of uh, over holidays. Yeah. Um, you know, same same excuse that you have, right? Yeah. I mean, well, I just want to write new content Christmas to New Year's. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm mostly still writing it, and and as my digital guy Tim Davis, who pushed me into doing it uh, all these years ago, said, "You've got a lot to say, and this would be a good platform for you." And at the time, I thought he was crazy. Like, who's going to read this thing, and how are people going to find it? But <laughs> you stick with it long enough, and 
it's it's amazing how it works. So I wouldn't know what to do if I didn't have a blog post to write at four thirty in the morning. So. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for for chatting with me and taking the time. Uh, I know that this is going to be like one of the best videos that I've done, and uh, I appreciate it so much. Well, I appreciate that. It was really kind of you to uh, to reach out and ask me to do this. And again, congratulations on doing this project, and uh, be safe and good luck. Okay. Uh,